morning, everybody. Um, and good on you for getting up this early. Um, some other times, a couple of years ago, we, we had one of these sessions at 9, 9 a.m., and I think we had about 7 or something like that. So, so that's good. <coughs> uh, my name is Matti Seikko. I'm the CIO, CTO in um, East Basel. And what, what, I'm, what I'm going to be talking about today um, is location intelligence and, and sort of talk a little bit about where it came from or it originated from and what kind of specific techniques we in East Basel have used to try to make it simpler and easier for people to use. Uh, so, so there's uh, several diagrams there uh, showing um, what kind of things we do and uh, what kind of things you need to think about when you're building your location intelligence solutions. Um, there are some examples of course of, or into the code that we do, but I'm not going to go into any heavy detail on that. My boys, uh, technical boys, organized all that, so don't ask anything too hectic on that. Okay, so start with the, the obvious one. So what kind of things we deem to be location intelligence? Starting from cleaning up the data, things like addresses. So addresses typically where you start. So you have customer data which you need to somehow tie to a geographical location. So you need to set up an address validation engine of some sort. Do it as a one-off or, or you know, usually put a system in there that, that does that for you while you go through. And then once you've done that, <coughs> You then build your geographical or mapping system, uh, and you use it to do analysis like thematic mappings, hotspotting, etc. And then you might also open it up for your for, for your geospatial devices, online or offline. And then you can use that to start doing modeling, modeling and workflows and ETL processes to to other systems, external and internal feeds, and all sorts of different techniques. And there's a lot of lot of tools and and uh, techniques available to do this. Most of them um, still more in the desktop side of things and you need to publish it into the web side and build a whole bunch of tools and on top of that to actually enable it for browser based systems. And then there's the standards. So OGC Open Geospatial Consortium has uh, published a whole whole heap of different standards for specifically for geospatial location intelligence. And why that is important is that if you comply with them, uh, it makes your life easier in the long, long run because you can actually swap over from different systems to the others re reasonably easily. Uh, you can send and, and transfer data between different various different systems. You can actually open up feeds out of your systems that most of the desktop tools, for example, can access, so that's quite useful. And then you have all the fringe um, location intelligence stuff happening, like crowdsourcing, you know, OpenStreetMap is, uh, is a great idea on how people can push their own data. And, and, and one of the Ed Katipas sessions on Monday, uh, there was a question somebody asked about the data, so I've actually added a slide in the end, listing all the URLs for the sort of open or free data available in New Zealand so that you guys can go and have a look at that. So there's, a, there's a lots of it available now. We're still behind the US and Europe. Um, US is leading. Their, their data is practically free across the board. Um, New Zealand is getting there. I mean, 10 years ago, buying a 10-user mapping data license costed you 150000 So, you know, now you can get it quite a lot cheaper than that. <coughs> So, a little bit of a history, and, and unfortunately, it, it's history, but it's also not history. The, this is one of the, the reasons that the geospatial and, and location intelligence has taken so long to, to become kind of mainstream that it is today. And, and it is that, that most of the organizations there still use it this way. So you have super users using desktop tools accessing data typically from binary files. So probably 90% of the larger organizations, they have a room of people who do this kind of stuff. And then those guys, if you're lucky, they might have a spatial database there. Most of them don't. And then they basically print maps or create PDFs and, and, and hand them over to their users. So that's very typical way still on how location intelligence intelligence is used in organizations. 
What's of course changing is things like ETL processes to data warehouses. So we're building two, two, two geospatial data warehouses right now for, for some of our customers. Um, it's pretty new and it's, it hasn't been done that much yet. And we, when we talk about data warehouses here, of course, we talk about the real deal, the star schema um, kind of a system with um, geospatial entities in there. So you build an ETL process in Microsoft Space, SSIS actually allows you to do that. And again, the nice thing is about that because a, a SQL Server uses the OGC standards, it means that we, we can use that information in the um, SSIS process. So what we do is um, there's a well-known text format that SQL Server provides. So you can actually take the data in well-known text form, break it into components, and then SSIS can deal with it. Because one of the problems is that SSIS doesn't deal with um, geometries, but it can deal it by, deal it by these uh, standards. <clears throat> and then you might open this up for portals. So MOS is big growing thing for everybody, I suppose. So yes, we tamper on that space as well. Uh, it's a nice way of pulling and pushing the data into the users via, via web parts and, and building little mechanism, mechanisms around separating your entities, etc. And you can, of course, then push it back to the GIS desktop again. So these guys who are creating all these different look and looks and look and feels for you can actually manipulate those maps and then keep on publishing it back. <coughs> Um, government, uh, government is promoting currently collaboration, so that's what's, what, what is happening more and more is that these systems there, look at that, soap is the wrong way around, oh, that's interesting, <laughs> that's a neat one, I wonder what that means, there's a meaning for that I'm sure. Um, so the idea there is that you can, rather than somebody, everybody building their own system, you can actually start opening up yours. And, and organizations just can just get a feed from your system. So you might be having some specific data to your organization that you want to share, um, and then you can open it up, and these guys can just access, access it and have, have it as a layer in their system. So this is a distribute, distributed centralized, I call it, because basically you're no longer now download it into your system, but you're just access it, accessing it from different places. And the typical standards for that in, in geospatial are web mapping service, uh, web feature service, and web coverage service. So they all sort of cater for that kind of information. Web feature service is a scary one because it actually, um, you can set it up in such a way that users can load the data, change it, and push it back. So. And, and as, as, as I mentioned, so sharing data and services is the way the world is going now. And it, it basically happens by these. These are all the different types of standards. Um, so mentioned the WMS, WFS, and WCS there. Um, KML is actually an open OGC standard now, so that was the Google's way of doing things. GML is a geographical metadata language which is used to uh, define what a geometrical object is and, you know, how it's constructed. Um, SOAP and REST, of course, everybody knows those are standard web services type of mechanisms. RSS, and then there's a GeoRSS, which is the one that we really care about, and that, that's just an RSS feed with a geographical component added to it, um, projection and datum and all that kind of stuff. A um, whole bunch of other standards as well, which are sort of fringe for us, but we need to think about. And then the tile service, which is so Google and Bing are the ones who started with this. So because we have so much data available nowadays, uh, terabytes and terabytes of that, tile service is a mechanism that then allows us to uh, do that tiling and just serve it out, make it fast in the net. And, uh, and great way, every system now is using that. That's a mechanism for it. So that's a statement from the ex-minister of internal affairs, um, globalized inferential reach. You know, um, geospatial really is of value to this. So st let's start looking into this. So per request per to self-service. So I showed you a little bit of a picture there on how 
the GIS people were using these things previously. You know, somebody came in and said, I, I need a neat map from the Gispen showing thematic shading on blah. And these guys would go on and beaver away and a week later come back with a map and say, here you go, this is, this is how we did it, do you like it, kind of thing. And that's, of course, changing now. So you have GIS applications with spatial data, um, which is then you need to get it into the SharePoint um, and GIS services. So you have technology to do that. You have uh, mechanisms to use that. I mean, SharePoint is a great one because it changes totally how we need to think about this. Typical GIS application used to be a map-centric, even the browser ones. You have a big map there and a whole, whole bunch of little things on the side, and you know, you could potentially pop up a, a form or things like that. But with, with MOSS, you need to think it through totally differently. So we have a customer who um, is, is, is migrating that, to that right now, and instead of having a one great map-centric system, we have about 40 different web parts. So, so that the people, the users, can actually start thinking of what kind of things are important for them and they can build their own look and feel. So you separate your entities out, you have search and navigation once, and the map is just one little control um, in there. So what happens is that these huge functionality-rich interfaces are used by a small percentage of the users, and there's going to be thousands and thousands of them um, using the other side of it. So police is, an, is a good example of that. Um, they, have, um, they had originally a system which was used by the GIS team, about 10 people or so, 5, 10 people or so. Um, now they have a system in place there which is used by everybody, about 9,000 policemen. And, and all of it is for various uses. Um, some of them really do analysis on the crime and you know, solving crime, but some of them just need to see where they need to go for the next day and you know, what, what is the sort of most obvious place that crime will happen. I can't unfortunately show you any screenshots of that because it is police after all. Also. So if you take business intelligence, I don't know, that looks horrible on mine. It does look a bit white. Um, so if you take uh, business intelligence, which is your typical dashboards, your you know, traffic lights, your, all these kinds of different information that you have, and then you take your location intelligence and tie that together. So it, in the end of the day, mapping, when you look at it on location and business intelligence, is just another way of viewing the data. So you use a chart, you use a table, you use you know, a map. If it has a geographical location, then that might be of relevance to you. And often it is, but often it isn't. And, and it's equally important to know if it's not. So you marry those together. That really does look pretty bad, doesn't it? That's quite white. Um, marry those together, and you, you get something like this. This is one of the, the, the projects that we did. And what you're supposed to see there, um, let's see, yeah. So this is a system where you have your traditional business intelligence bits over there. So you have your charts, you have your table view, you have your um, um, bars, and, and it's all tied together. So, so in this particular one, you pick up areas of interest from the map or from the charts or any one of these and, and it basically shows you how that all relates together. So this particular one, what this is, was used for was to try to decide where to put a new retail outlet. So using um, New Zealand Post uh, Genius data, which is a segmentation on customers and what they do, they have, they've actually recorded it on a, on a question level which we had access to. We could look at things like if we're wanting to um, put a BP, for example, into somewhere there, how many people prefer that and how many people prefer sale and you know so it, it was quite interesting and it's a neat way of doing that um, then if you start looking at the template so the idea here is that um, um, this is not a, an architecture diagram what this is about this is showing you what kind of components you need to think about when you're building um, your geographical system. So what we've done here is I've, I've sort of separated this all into tiers and, and tell you a little bit, not, not just about the SQL Server, which is 
than Microsoft ones that are the obvious ones, but the other competitor ones the, that are available as well. So if you look at databases, those are the, the, the six main databases that you have currently available. Um, dollar sign means that that's the, um, that has a cost associated to it. Obviously, the open source ones don't. Um, SQL Server does, just has a standard cost because SQL Server Spatial is embedded in, but Oracle, for example, have a Spatial version, which is quite an expensive piece, piece that you put on, put on top of it. Then you have your uh, super user tools there that you can use to manipulate. So those are the ones that you, your people would use to create the actual maps. You can create them with XML, but that's really painful. I mean, OGC has a, um, a style standard that you can use. Yes, you can do that. It's going to take, it take you a long, long time. So these, these tools, even if you had just one, it means that you can open it up, you can do and create a neat, unique look, brand it, and then basically just save it, and then you can use it basically in these systems. That's the idea with it. But that's all you do with it, typically in a, in a browser environment. Then you, then you need some kind of a mapping renderer there. And, and, and note that there's no Bing there. Bing, Bing and Google, from our perspective, are not mapping renderers. They are a presentation layer. They will come on this diagram a little bit later. But they are used for <coughs> giving you a template, whereas this is used to take your unique data and typically either on a file create a layer of it that you can render on top whatever you use, or you, you can do it in the back end and then just push tiles out. So there's uh, various mechanisms to do that. So uh, what, what the color coding there means <coughs> is those are the Microsoft environment ones. So SQL Server, obviously, um, ArcGIS, MapExtreme, and SAP, and those are all .NET mapping engines. The other ones require a little bit more in them. So um, all of it works in the latest versions, all the way from one ASP.NET 1 to basically all the way to 4. There's no difference to that. And like Ed said on Monday, mapping isn't special. It's just a part of the systems and just used to, to do it that way. And then you have your UI bits where we have our Bing maps and, and Esri map it and the Google and the JavaScript framework. <coughs> the important bit here is that um, a lot of it can be, quite a lot can be done with JavaScript framework, and we've done that previous. So what I'm going to do when we go through this, I'm going to show you how we've evolved as a company, starting with pretty much with, with JavaScript and then going on what, you, what we're using now, because it's not the best way of doing things. And you can then attach your mobile APIs onto that one as well. Mobile is just another device, slightly different way of building systems, but richness, um, HTML5 is coming as well, that's kind of interesting, so it's going to hazy the boundaries a bit and what is done and where. Um, we use Silverlight a lot now, um, gives you a great mechanism, easy to build interfaces for mapping. Typically, we would use it in conjunction with a mapping engine which might or might not have an API that you can actually use as well, makes it even easier. So, you know, then you really do get this rapid application development. Um, I have both HTML, JavaScript, and Silverlight um, highlighted there because you have these rules still in government, for example, where the e-government rules where you have to enable a one without plugins. So you have a plug-in version which gives you richer interface and then you have the non-plug-in non version and ba basically both using the same information so there's not, mo not much overhead for it, it's just the interface bits that change. And then the users on top of that. So like I said, it's not an architecture diagram, it's, we use this as a mechanism for, you, for our customers when we're trying to define what they actually want to use. So this gives us a way of thinking about all the different components that they're going to need. So here's one. All the, all the graphics actually suck, which is a bit of a, okay. This is the one that we did for one, one of the new customers right now. So basically, in there, on the top la layer there, you can see is uh, our two different applications. One is used for public access, so it's just using the JavaScript framework. In this particular case, open layers. 
because that's quite a safe way of providing um, application that um, is cross-browser compliant. And then we have a, a more sort of an internal or external, if you wish, application which is used for, for doing these analysis and like, clever analysis and editing, etc., which uses Silverlight. And then we have, we use um, SharpMap, the old uh, Codeplex mapping engine there for rendering. Um, it's just, it's just great for simple things, so you can, you can use it to create um, when you need to do, work with a couple of layers only, but we have customers with hundreds of layers, so typically for that you would want to buy a, a commercial engine at, that works a little it's a, it's a bit more reliable and gives you more sort of a power under the hood. SQL Server 2008, of course, um, all of the spatial and integration services are web services, so just, just we built them around it just as a communication mechanism. So, okay, I'm, I'm going to tell you later why I put this slide in. Um, my location intelligence, so proactive versus reactive, so basically um, Nowadays, if, if you do want to be successful in business, you need to be proactive. Everybody says that. But how, how do you be one and how do you measure it? High profit, satisfied customers, happy employees. Now, why I have this slide in here is that we, as an organization, geospatial is growing rapidly right now. So we, as an organization, have been looking for developers for quite some time. So this is actually promotion. So anybody... Uh, look it again into the wonderful word of location intelligence, please come and have a chat with me afterwards. So promotion, you profitable company, but what, I'm, what I wanted to go in and talk about is the happy employees bit. So <coughs> location intelligence is brilliant. It's, it's, for developers, it's the greatest thing because you're actually building something really graphical that customers and users really like. And, and funny enough, like in East Basel, we have we, all of the guys that started with us pretty much 12 years ago are still with us. So none of our guys have ever left. Um, that's how good fun it is. So that's why I had this slide here. There you go. All right. <clears throat> so these are the examples I'm going to use. The first template we built in 2004, um, which was based on the ASP.NET web services. Second one, 2007, so this was pure JavaScript. That was a big um, thing going on with all these things like Yahoo and um, all these guys coming up with frameworks, so we built one. And um, then the last one, the third one that we're working right now on, and, and I have examples of all of those, is Silverlight. Um, to start from the, from the little bit of an overview. So th this is a kind of, kind of, kind of a busy one. So 2004 one, this is kind of what it looks like. So again, like always, we have two different I interfaces. And, and 2004, we were still working on Java applets. There wasn't an, another really good way of making a, a rich map. What's important to note is that this doesn't mean that we are building Java applet applications. This means we are building only the mapping bit with the applet. And then we had JavaScript version, which was used for the public use, and you could just, just um, do that. And typically what happened at that time was that the public one took three times as long to do and the rest, because you have to, you know, all the um, other browser compliance and stuff, you had to basically do it all manually. It was quite painful. And then you separate all the forms, the searching, the reporting, everything else is separated out into the ASP.NET. Um, couple of reasons for that. Uh, first of all, we suck at doing those. Uh, we've never been good at it. So what we tend to do instead is we um, work together with other organizations. So one of the implementations we did on this one was done together with Front, and they did all that kind of stuff, which they were good at and we weren't. So that worked quite well. Second one, <coughs> all the mapping was done with JavaScript. For, so we used the Yahoo user interface. Um, components, which was quite easy to use and worked quite well. So essentially worked the same way, so again it was only the mapping bits that used that and everything else was pushed out to the ASP.NET. But also at this stage we actually introduced the idea of starting to use services. 
and, and rather than, because the previous one was just accessing by radio to net directly to the database and pulling data in. This one, everything is via services. And the idea there is, of course, that that means it's easy enough for us to, to swap over things if we need to. So we've always been trying to um, um, separate things as much as we can. And there's again examples on, on that uh, that is used. But we used REST services for that. And then the latest one that we're working through now, um, we've gone back to the, hey, you need two versions because basically in this case now it's about standards. So um, you have a JavaScript version which we built with open layers um, and which is quite easy and fast to build. And then you have the, the RIA components done with Silverlight. So again, this is about the map only. Everything else hanging off that. So, so there we have, we've built a whole bunch of plugins um, for reporting services, for integration services, for MOS web parts, etc. So that means that it's all sort of not just a centralized data repository, but it's also a centralized system that you can start pulling and calling and using um, from different places. So start from the, the beginning. So first one, um, so say space or database, in this particular case, we used a third party one. There wasn't a, a one available from SQL Server at the time. This is another important distinction, um, and it actually kind of makes us a bit unique. Most of the geospatial integrators or location intelligence integrators there tend to do the business logic in the middle tier. So the application is doing all the clevers, and it might be using the mapping engine to do that. We don't do it that way. We never have. We push as much of the business of the space, geospatial business logic into the database, which is like Ed was high, uh, pointing out that um, they are now getting 400 millisecond queries to be four, four, to, four to eight millisecond queries. I mean, that's... That's amazing. That means that we can really use the power of the database to do all this work, and then we just pull it, just pull the end results into the middle tier, meaning we are really minimizing the traffic, we're minimizing the, the, the overhead on that particular middle tier, and using the database how the database is supposed to be used. Second important um, thing there is use of procedures or functions. So, when you, like us, we work with other organizations, whether it's a customer who wants to start building their own system or whether it's um, um, other integrators, we're saying just special is not special, it's not, but there are some learning involved. So what we do instead uh, for you to have to actually learn what it all is, we create you store processes and functions to do all these kinds of things. So for example, you would have one there that says, give me a, a buffer where the buffer is the, um, you, you pass it the geometry and the buffer that you want and it pull, pull pushes you back that and it, it's all done in the store proc, so you don't have to worry about that. Or addressing, give, here's an address string, give me the results back, etc. So that's the idea how it works. So, for example, that's an example of one. So, that's uh, you, you give it, you tell it the layer that you want to, or table you want to work with, the extent of the map, and then that will then give, give you back of all the geometries of that type, or of that table, within your given map. So, if you're a web developer, you know, that makes perfect sense to you. You know what your current extent is. You call that, it brings your results back, and you, you can then, populate the map by yourself. Then you can use tools to go closer, send another request, brings the results back. Easy, you don't have to worry about what happens on the background. Um, this one um, lets you sort of look at, uh, let me think, what did this do? <laughs> so this one uh, gives you the um, results as a WKT, so well-known text. The reason for that is that um, not all um, mapping engines can deal with the geometry, so you might have to actually uh, translate it into a language that it un understands, and all, all, all of them understand WKT. So this will give you the, rather than the native geometry, which gives you a well-known text string back, which you can then use to populate the map. And the last one on, on of these examples, um, this one give, will give you property layers. So this is labels. So you switch on labels on your map. How do you do it? You call this. This brings you the text and the XY positions back so that you can, uh, you can then 
put it into the into your system. Um, then we had some HTML JavaScript controls on the, the first example. So we had a sp special one for map, one for legend, one for scale bar, layer control, and then a messaging one. And that typically the parameters were just sent through via URL. So you would th say things like height, width, what kind of image type you want back, simple stuff. So like I said, this was done on 2003, 2004. So, you know, things have changed a bit. And then you'd had JavaScript functions that you used then to, to set the map to, like what, what's the one that you've selected, how you pan it, you know, getting scales, setting messages, all that kind of stuff that, that you can use easily from the browser. So this is set map tool call. So that would be a collection of tools, which would first it would call a use map tool to tell the map that, hey, this is the particular one we want to use. Then it would get an image back to say, what would, what would we actually do, and then set map tool would then, would then say that and now we want to next use the following tool. So as you can see, this is actually means that the, the server end is keeping the session. So there's, a, there's an active session going on there on this particular one. We had a whole bunch of different requests, getting map images, lay, legends, layer controls, etc set requests, so gets and sets, so get, get information to me, set the information there, go to, where, where do you want to go, to the territorial authority or a locality or a property or a coordinates or a, you know, pretty much anything you can think of, login, etc. So if you want it, if you use get, get map image, we would say, hey, what my, what my hit and weight is, uh, hit, hit and weight is, and then you'd give it a map coordinates and that would translate it to you in the screen coordinates so you have a mechanism to do it between these two. Or another one, get codes at points so you give it screen coordinates and a session ID so that it knows who you are and then it gives you the real ones back so that you can work that against the database. Or you can do a hover over or you can you know, do these kinds of tools. Um, Lose, lose the sound for a little while there. So get distance web service, for example, calculates a crow fly between two points. Example core would have been like that, so you give it screen coordinates back, and then that would translate, that, so that's the parameters there, that would translate it into, a, and, and bring you a response back, saying it's 253 units of your choice. And possible error, error scenarios as well, that your assessment might expire and all that kind of stuff. So, like I said, it was done seven years ago. Things have changed a lot since that. Um, how it looked like, so we would have a test template because we, we didn't build the app front it, for example, on that particular one. Um, so we would have a test template which we used to dry things out and then and prove that everything worked and then handed it over to the integrator who actually integrated the whole thing. So, for example, there you would, you, you'd use the go to ID. You've given it an ID. Um, and press the button and it would then give you a mapping interface back and say, hey, that's what you just did. So that's now using those scenarios. Or, or you take adjacent information and say, hey, that's the button there. You can't actually see that, but there are different colors on the map used on showing all the adjacents that are of similar type. And so on. So you pick Auckland area in there on top, or you, know, you get the picture. So that's how it works, quite, quite simple. Configuration um, would be done by XML, so there would be several different ones, so web config, web XML, and map rendering one. So the first two would be to set up all your, your traditional look and feel and your connect, connectivity and IP addresses and all that kind of stuff. The last one, the map rendering one, is the way how you tell it what the map looks like. So this is the one that we use those super user tools to create rather than edit it manually. You can, but you don't really want to. Um, so that's, that's the idea there. Oops. Nice thing is that there's no application development required added, uh, needed to add new layers because you get new data all the time and not, not just new rows into the, but new, brand new data sets from other vendors, etc. So 
this one required you to do no development on that. You just add it into why uh, the map rendering XML and suddenly you have a new layer there and you have it, you can see it on your layer control and it's on your legend and you know, all that is done quite and made quite easy. And there's no geospatial expertise required from anybody who wanted to use that. So they plug it in, a um, little bit of an IP transfer going on and we of course handed the code over. That's always been our policy. We don't we don't own the code, the customer does. So they can then build their system around that easily and just use those cores and not worry about what happens in the back end. Um, example one that we use, this, this was a um, QV website, the um, info base, so it's used for um, property valuation. So you type in your address there, as we do, and that'll take you to the map that like, then give you information about your property and you can, all of those little things there, you can click on one and it'll take you and give you a report which uses the mapping in, the, in it as well and there's a cost associated and very successful business. You can do things like um, sewing the, how did they, how, how was this defined? Um, what everybody wants is the, um, the cheapest house in the richest street. So that's actually what that is sewing. So, um, it shows how your house compares to the other ones around you or, or the house that you're planning to buy, how it compares to the other ones around you. Different types of um, interfaces for, so this shows you local sales. So if you want to know what the other ones costed, so there has a little number on, on every one of them and then you can scroll down and see what it looks like. And, you know, a whole bunch of information and that was all done with that template school zones as well because that might be important you might need to know that hey I, my my daughter wants to go to Onslow College actually happened to us I wants to go to Onslow College we had to buy a house which is within that school zone boundary okay example number two <clears throat> again database end doesn't change exactly the same way we do or everything we can on the database um, when we started this um, SQL Server was really on an alpha stage. We were one of the six, I think the one of the few in the world actually testing the the pre-beta version and trying to find out how it worked and, and get it going, and that was great. Um, so there was no data connectors, no drivers, nothing for it, so we had to build all that from scratch. So, so the mapping engines, there were two different mapping engines we supported on that, so we, we built those and then actually published it all out as a as an open source so that other organizations can use the same stuff. Um, because of that, we, we built a separate one, a third one, which was a, a OGC well-known binary, well-known text standard, which is still used. So the nice thing about that was that that was actually um, mapping engine independent. So pretty much any mapping engine would kind of plug it in. You've customized it a bit, obviously, to fit into specific calls, but it could be, work, it could be used against any mapping renderer. And, and we got a huge, great performance out of that. This one used uh, YUI. Um, quite a neat interface, actually. Everything was nice and floating, and you know you could dock things, and got quite an easy one to use. Auto sizing the maps, and the, you know all that kind of stuff that you expect to get. It's actually quite painful to do um, when you have separate things in your map like a let's say a layer control and a legend and a um, forms and a map and you know you change this auto size that what do you, how do you actually manage that so that was all built into the engine you could create new apps um, by deploying the core map application and, and then just copying wanted tools and, and there's an example I saw on that how that works um, interface tools manipulated look and feel controlled by CSS so yeah, and you can't see that one that well either. Um, basically, the idea was that all the tools were were stored as separate components. So, customer could have could come up with totally standalone versions of this, which only included some of the functionality. And that really was by just dragging and dropping the the libraries that you needed into your project, and they automatically popped up the tools, and you know were enabled on the mapping, which made it really, really easy to use. 
similarly, like you had the, all these controls there, so you had zooming controls, meaning, you know, where do you want to go, setting and getting, searching, you know, all the kind of similar stuff we had on the previous one as well. Um, of course, like all the um, developer organizations, they re we renamed everything. It's not the cleverest thing to do, but hey, you have to. Um, and um, example there, okay, search TLA station uh, means that we are within the territorial authority. We want to get a bunch of stations in and, and, and find, find information about that. The big thing with this was that this is, is, this is the real one where we started using the special services, or web services across the board. So for example, this one gets all of the satellite and aerial imagery actually from the cloud. And we did the first version in 2006. So um, well, it, it really is terabytes of data. Currently, it's about 12 terabytes that they access and load in as layers into the map. We also built a whole bunch of other services to do predictive typing, kind of search and navigation interfaces, um, uh, um, which actually da do and tie about you know 70 different tables on the back end there and pull the information back. Everything configurable by XML. And then info services that you could like, plug through a hole and say, give me information back with you know specific parameters, like only the visible layers or um, only my core layers or, you know. And, and then we built the spatial services. So in this one, the previous one, store procedures were just accessed by the mapping engine. On this one, we have a web service layer between, which is just a flow through. It's not, no clever on it at all. So if you look at one of the address ones, how that works, so you basically, you, know, you can't see it, but you start typing in on the top there, and every time you type a letter in, it sends a SOAP request over to the, to the typehead web service that then flows it through to the database, which basically returns you whatever result it ca comes back and populates a little list. And then when you pick some, one from the list, you, you call another request, which is that in this case get address details one, sends parameters through that figures it out, gives you all the information, how it needs to be formatted, you know, the X, Y's on three different projections, uh, goes to the statistical one and gets other information as well, so that then you can push it all back as these are my results on it. And that's, that's super fast. There's no um, delays there at, at all. Or if you do an imagery one, uh, basically that's a layer control. So if you double a layer on, like say satellite imagery on, then that sends a web mapping service request to the cloud, which then pulls it out, uh, checks that you're, you're, you're allowed to do that to start with, and if you are, then talks to the tile service that pushes the tile back, basically, and that's how it works. So every time you do anything, any manipulation on a map, it just does one of those. Means that, that terabytes of data access happens in the cloud, and it just gives you the whatever your resolution image happens to be. So it's, it's really fast. Test template looked like that. Um, very, not very innovative, I suppose. Um, you would have your, your navigation there. You would be able to pull in different types of maps there. You could push specific tools um, and get things like layer controls up and, you know, changing all. So it was all in that one control, if you wish. Zooming in and testing all that kind of stuff. Uh, messages coming if you don't find information, what, what's going on, etc. It's a bit of a shame because you can't see that that well, but yeah, okay. Um, and additional searches. So there's a whole bunch of other searches in there which do specific things for the customer. Um, LAR, linear, linear referencing, etc. Sample core apps would be something like that. So this is this is a one where almost everything is hidden. So you just type it in and off you go. Same way, you have three different configurations in this web config, web XML, and map rendering. It's so that nothing really changed there. 
what we did do is we created, uh, because we had customers with hundreds and hundreds of layers, we created a new innovative way of dealing with um, different levels of layers. So what you, what you have is you, first you group all the layers into tabs, then within the tab you group it to groups, and then within the group you have the actual layers. So particular one was NZTA at the time, uh, they had 280 layers on their mapping data. So this way it actually becomes manageable. You can actually find easily what kind of things you, you require. Same, exactly the same as previously. No, no development required to add new layers, uh, change the look and feel, etc. Um, and absolutely no geospatial expertise required from the integrated partner ones. So we did together work for NZTA with um, Fujitsu on this. And, and they built again uh, most of the sort of forms, etc., on one of the applications there. So this is this is how this looks like. So this is an NZTA one. Now I've, actually, the, all of these can be dug up from the net, so so I'm not showing any secret stuff here. Um, but basically, there one does have a mapping interface, a little bit of tools on the left hand side, um, and then all the kind of layer controls, all the other mechanisms that you want to see are sort of pop up. And then there's another one called uh, Trace, which is used for road event information. So this is event management system. Um, so things that if there are road works in the roads or anything like that, it's, it's why this. And then these guys publish it into InfoConnect, which is, a, which, is a, which is an RSS feed that anybody can access, and that will tell you information about uh, blockages in the roads and things like that. Um, Here's an example um, of where we, we were playing with that uh, imagery feed. So what you're seeing here is historical view before and after, so uh, 2006 versus 2009 Wellington. And then you can also, um, I don't even know if you can see that, but in the middle there, if you, that there is like a see-through kind of a um, rectangle pan, if you wish, that you can move around and look at specific bits, uh, places in the map, so it's kind of a way to do the historical kind of stuff. And then you can do hover over, so you can hover over your things on top of land parcels and, and then you get a whole bunch of um, other web services from, like in this case, Quotable Value or PIQ, which you can call and bring that same kind of data that you use in the, the QV side about your properties. Number three is the new stuff. So this is all pure SP, uh, SQL Server Spatial. Nothing changed on the top end, geospatial, same way as before. We use um, R2, which is the latest version. There's a lot of uh, speed, uh, performance improvements, um, huge number of complicated spatial procedures. We've integrated all our addressing and navigation services. And, and we fully integrated that with SSRS, SSRS, and MOS. SSRS was actually a pain in the neck. That was really tricky to do. The problem was that um, the only way that could deal with mapping was by dynamic rendering. And when you do dynamic rendering with a huge number of layers, you know, your report took a minute to run, which is not a good look. So we couldn't get it, um, originally couldn't get it working with a tile case. Um, so that's where most of the work was. We put like months on that and eventually figured it out. So that one I'm not going to share with you. A lot of IP on that. <laughs> and complicated change detection process. So all the data that is coming in, we've built in the maintenance processes there to figure out what changes. Because funny enough, if you get data from a mapping vendor, it's not like your other vendors who give you delta. Nah, this guy always gives you everything. And typically, it's worse than that. Um, mo most cases, the IDs have changed. So you can't actually tie it relationally and say, what happened to number seven, uh, um, let's say property number 17. Uh, in theory, you can, but not reality. So you need to kind of go and do it spatially and see, has the actual polygon or the line or, you know, has any of that changed? Two types of methods. We have an IMAP host interface. Uh, which, which is all the callback events on the map control, error handling, event management, selection, fetching, 
all that kind of stuff. So these are the kinds of things you do. So functions like on select parcel or on select info or on set property, on get code info, on map initialized. You know, it's a huge number of these. And then I map interface, which is exposes the actual map controls, changing the map behavior, how it works, what kind of what it looks like. How do you activate it? What happens when you activate it? You know, do you highlight it or put a tooltip over or, you know, etc. And those, those kind of looks like some of these are like set map mode or set extents. Kind of very similar to the previous ones in a way what they do. Um, like I said, you know, mapping isn't special. Location intelligence is not special. This is how it works. Address search, corner off, road name search, whole bunch of different navigation and validation services. Web services, but we typically wrap them um, like jQuery access to the database, which was quite a neat way of doing that. Um, and all forms, you know, just ASP.NET, and only the map control in Silverlight. Because, you know, uh, you can do forms in Silverlight, but I think the ASP.NET is still perfectly viable for that and we just use it for this and then we use spatial services to validate topology so we, we let people draw on the map so you might have a scenario where you need to make sure that the, the drawn polygons don't overlap and if they do you need to you know either tell you or cut it off the bit that was wrong or people draw knots if you do, do a knot in the mapping system, it lets you, but it's a painful to, to deal with it because the direction of the nodes changes and all that kind of stuff. Um, exporting and importing. So, so we built facilities and functionality there for you to, to allow the users to load data in, whether it's point slides and polygons. Again, most of it done in the database side, so you have a kind of a staging schema, load it in there and processes, ETL processes, then to push it as a push it out as a mapping layer. Um, pretty much apparently everything was fully, uh, is fully config configurable, so you can easily add anything you want in without any kind of um, developer um, required to do it. A little bit about Silverlight, um, why we use it as a map control. This is a um, study that Microsoft did, did a little while ago, and they actually compared using the um, JavaScript on various different browsers versus against uh, using a Silverlight. And the idea there was that in the mapping specifically, you need to load a whole bunch of points. If you do want to do it, like render it on, the, on, on top of the map and actually show you where the nodes are and maybe let you change it and manipulate that, then you actually physically have to bring the object to the map. If you do it with JavaScript, this is kind of the results you get. So this is the um, kind of number of nodes. So if you if you used Firefox there, 1,000 nodes would take you five seconds to pull it in. Um, whereas in Silverlight, the same thing is 2,000, two times that, 2,000 nodes with, within half a second. So this is about 10 times uh, better performance in Silverlight on doing this kind of mechanism that there is in traditional JavaScript. So take your land parcel, for example, is usually around, uh, let's say, 3,000 nodes. That could be 15 seconds versus three quarters of a second. So it's a huge difference. A rural one, it's even worse. So your parcels are huge there. So if you need to pull them in, it, it's just going to take you a long time. And if you can't do that, if you can't use a plugin, then the only way to get, a, get away with that is to do a tile service. And tile service is a great thing, but it's a pick of a thing to build. You need a super grunty PC somewhere which goes away and works for three weeks and creates millions and millions of tiles, and then eventually it's done, and the next delivery of data comes and starts again. So, yes, it's painful, but. So this is what the test template looks like. So it's a whole bunch of stuff on the left hand side. So those are all the different kind of calls that you can do. And then the interface is just showing you the, the different kind of tools. So your overview map, we had a little, we created a little um, pop-up there that has all your go-to things built into that. So that's all fully configurable. You can actually introduce your favorites and all that kind of stuff. So that 
people when they log into the system it'll automatically give you the one that you use and all that kind of stuff. It's really user friendly. So pick one and it takes you there. Uh, you press a button there to give you a layer control which tells you information about that. Um, some of the calls you do there, um, selecting features for example might pull the data out as a polygon and then actually zooms there as well and you know so highlights it and all that kind of stuff. Or if you want to just put a um, point in, so in this case it uh, selected the next Y and then say asked it to put a little red dot on, on top of that. Put in other features there that if you have, have selected a whole bunch of um, polygons, uh, like properties for example, we have a little circle there when you start zooming out, because you know, if you're polygon and you zoom out, you see nothing basically. So we have a little circle there that when you zoom out, it tells you how many is actually selected underneath that, and you can click it and it takes you there. So it's all about the usability and user friendliness, what's required. Um, drawing, so you, you can full drawing capabilities on all this. Um, so we started one, and then that's sort of what it ends up like. And then you can edit it as well. You can click on it, and it gives you all the notes, and you can drag and drag and move them, and you know all the sort of standard very rich mapping functionality. Um, so the idea there um, is that um, all of the initial parameters are sent to the Silverlight, um, and layer control and legend are all configurable. Um, XML is used to configure the styles and layers. GIS editor tools used to maintain it, which is neat because it makes it really easy for us. Um, some implementation examples, the one that we showed sort of slowly, um, shortly previously, one slide of it, so this is one of these. Um, so it lets you basically, if you select one, it starts, you know, building little buffers around it and it changes every time you pick another one. And then you, when you pick outside it, it puts a, another one in and put, populates all the information. Um, you can change your, what you prefer and it's also a different kind of information about that, um, put in thematic shading on deprivation and whatever different things you might want to do, um, address type ahead, you know, all used with that tool. And then something a little bit more complicated with the full-on editing kind of capability, this is buffering a, a polygon there, um, this is just selecting one polygon, bringing it through, um, showing the nodes so that you can manipulate things showing specific um, information when you click on the polygon, that's a little uh, info to a special service back to the database with all the information, tying it with the, all the other databases. So, so you might have all the, only the geospatial information in the spatial database, but a whole bunch of other ones there where you might want to bring in financial information, etc. That's as far as spatial services and links joining it all together. Uh, what was his showing stations? Uh, so this is another data set that I can't tell you about. Um, but basically the idea is that it, in this particular case you can view the data within that one polygon and try to see sort of what kind of customers are living. These are, these are their customers, where are the concentrations of them and whether they can find anything significant about them that they can use to then market to other customers. <laughs> That's how that works. And this is a brand new one which has just gone live uh, for New Zealand um, Historic Places Trust. Um, so it's a non-map centric application. It's about finding um, protected places and when there are projects going on, what they look like. So you have, you do, a, so basically what we did was a search there to start with and then go through and get some information about that. And then one of the tabs is a map where you can see where it is. Then you can draw like these projects, so they're going to do a major work in a particular area, and this is the area affected. And then you can automatically get all the information, all the historic places within that area, so that you can start dealing with that. Pop uh, manipulating that and changing it, and uh, etc. Um, showing, uh, sorry, showing other information that hangs over which is of importance and messages and notifications and all that kind of stuff. So all done with the same template. The 
only other area of interest then is, is, is all these different type of things. I'm actually against these, these kind of portal products. So what these are, and there's a whole bunch of them, this gives you out of the box web application. So this is a typical 80-20 rule. With, you know, you can get it really easily up and running. Um, and it will give you access to do all sorts of stuff. But if you need to change anything, it's a major thing. It's really, really hard. So this is just listing some of them. That's uh, MapInfo's uh, Exponé, which is a product like that. You just set it up. Off you go, load your data in, done kind of thing. There's you, yeah, you have an app browser application without any kind of work required. And you can create, totally create a different look and feel for it. That is easy enough. It's really the additional tools and the existing tools that are hard to use. And that's Esri's Deco, similar kind of thing. This is actually easier to use than the MapInfo one, but I hate them equally. Um, Another one, this is an Australian one. So this is, um, the interesting thing about this is that this works with Googles and Bings and, you know, pretty much anything. It's kind of like um, floating on top of different mapping engines and then you can start defining how you use that. Uh, this is our Canadian research partner, um, um, Korem, who's done this, Push and See, one used, um, used in various um, organizations over the world. And then Map.net is the pure Microsoft one, which you probably might have heard. So it works in the same way again. It uh, lets you do all sorts of things out of the box, quite an easy to use tool. Um, yeah, so this is the second to last slide. So this is the one I promised to put in. This is where you get your free data from huge amount of data available there nowadays. So that these slides will be available to download, so you can just start using these. Um, I sort of put them into the bit of a priority order, I think, as well. So that the, the top one there is kind of almost a portal to the rest of them, where you need to go to. OpenStreetMap, that gets better all the time. Um, coordinates, you need to pay for the delivery, but, you know, the costs are really small. And then it's worth, worth talking to fire service who maintains the localities. Stuart is there? Yeah. So he, he can provide that. Uh, Linz, BDE, address data sets, road data sets, they, they have, the cost is minimal. And then the post, postcode boundaries, geo path, you know, all that is available with a small cost. And that's me.